I'm not always the best listener. I know that's probably, those probably aren't very comforting words coming from a pastor, but it's true. Sometimes I'm not the greatest listener. I feel like I used to be better. Maybe not, or at least I thought I was until I got married. And um, it was very quickly pointed out to me after that, uh, because when Sarah and I got married, she pointed out that I had an interrupting problem. Like she'd tell me a story, tell me something about, about her day or about school, about work. And then in her story, she would say something that would trigger something inside me and remind me of a similar experience that I had. And then I would proceed to interrupt her story to tell her my story that just popped into my head because of her story. And for years, it would frustrate her to no end. She would say, you just interrupted me. And in my high and mighty ignorance, I would say, no, I didn't. I'm conversing with you. And she'd say, no, you interrupted me. And again, I'd say, no, I was responding to you. You were telling me a story and to show you just how engaged I really am in your story, I responded to which she would say, yeah, but I wasn't finished. And then I'd say, yeah, but if I wait until you're finished, I'll forget what I was going to say. And then she'd say, yeah, but if you interrupt me, then I forget what I was saying. And then I said, oh, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, actually. And so I'd like to say that I just don't do this anymore. I'd like to say that after 20 years, I've learned my lesson. And now I always wait until she's finished talking before I respond. But the truth is, I still do it sometimes, even after 20 years. So pray for us. But, but honestly, my listening problem isn't just limited to interrupting people. Sometimes I just tune people out too. Anyone else guilty of that? Okay, thank you. Sometimes you just tune people out and it's not like you do it on purpose. It's not like I'm, I'm doing it intentionally. I'm just, I just happen to be thinking of something else when they start talking. And for some reason, my brain just never shifts over into that conversation. And so what happens is I inadvertently just find myself grunting at them. Like, uh-huh, yeah, uh -huh. You know, in their pauses, mm. I find myself just grunting at people. And I'm confessing that to you this morning because it's really not funny, right? It's really not okay um, that we do this. Uh, but I'm hoping people in here can identify with my weakness and, and share. Because listening for me can be hard work sometimes. Because for me to do it well, one of several things has to happen. OK, first of all, I either need to be in the right frame of mind, I have to find myself in the right context where I've got where I feel I've got time to listen. Or I need to be really interested in what the other person is saying, like what they're saying is one of the, is a topic that I'm really interested in. And so I zero in. But if you know, either two of those things don't happen, then for me to be a really good listener, I just really need to be willing to stop what I'm doing and really focus on the person talking. For me to listen well, one of those three things need to happen. And it's usually number three, right? I just need to take the time, stop what I'm doing and focus on the person speaking. But sadly, I didn't really learn this technique of listening until I went to work in social work. Isn't that sad? Like, like, I don't think I was a jerk or anything before that. But I also don't think I really knew how to converse with people in a in a proper, respectful and dignified way until I went to work for somebody else. And they taught me and this is what they taught me. They said, listen to understand not to respond. You know, listen to understand, 
not to respond. And here's why. Because if someone is talking to you and in the middle of what they're saying, you are already formulating a response in your head, guess what? You've only been half listening. And if you're only half listening, then you're not doing it very well. And you're also not being a very good friend, right? And so when I learned that, it was like this huge aha moment for me. And I was like, wow, how did I get to be 36 years old and not know this, you know? But then sadly, the more I practiced this new listening skill, the more I was aware of how other people listened. And I realized that there are a lot of people out there who don't listen very well. Right? Like there's a lot of people out there who are having conversations who aren't really listening. They're just waiting for their turn to talk. And sadly, I I think this kind of half hearted, you know, half listening communication style can also sometimes manifest itself in our prayer lives, can it? I think it happens in a couple ways. First off, I think that sometimes when people pray, they don't think God is really listening to them. I do. I think that people are used to not being heard or not feeling listened to or not feeling understood. And I think a lot of people have this idea that God is just busy. And what they have to say probably isn't very important anyway. And I understand this kind of logic because I'm human and he's God. But beyond that, I just told you sometimes I have such an ADD brain that for me to really listen well, I either need to be just in the right context, be really interested in what somebody's saying, or I need to be intentional, stop what I'm doing and just pay attention, right? That's what I've got to do to listen. But but we can't put those same expectations on God, right? I mean, when I compare all the noise in my head, right, all of the jumbled thoughts in my brain and all the responsibilities that I'm thinking about, when I compare all of those with the roar of the universe, right, and all the things that God is probably doing right now just to hold the earth in its orbit, right? Just to keep things going. Or when I think about all the prayers of, the pli- of those from whose plight is much more desperate than mine, all those poor souls who are suffering or who are in pain or in, in danger, or who are are in extreme poverty right now, when I think about that, I'm just like, God, yeah, never mind. I'm good. I'm good. You know, you just keep doing what you're doing. You keep the universe going, and I'll just stay over here, and I'll handle it. I mean, that's... Surely God has more important things to attend to than my little issues. But I tell you... That's not what the Bible says. And to think that God really hears us, I mean really hears us is almost unbelievable, isn't it? And then to think that he really wants to hear from us, that he desires to hear from us, well, that's just almost crazy. Because honestly, most of us probably grew up in homes where where we had fathers who sincerely loved us, but they really just kind of put up with us. And here's what I mean. I'm not, I'm not trying to slide anybody or talk bad about anyone's father here, but you know, most times, you, I mean, you know, the good father figures that I had in my childhood, they were good guys. They were present. They went to work. They paid their bills. They were there. And if you did what they said, Okay, if you did what they said and you left them alone, things went well. Okay, things were, the things were pretty good. But, but, but if you were a kid that required a lot of private attention, that wasn't always perceived as a good thing, right? You were, you know, a dad didn't always like all of that extra attention he had to put on, 
on, on you. And so it's hard for those of us who kind of had these, these kind of you know, typical dads, these typical earthly fathers, to really believe that my heavenly father really wants me to bother him with my problems. He really wants me to do this. Like he wants to hear from me and he wants to hear what I have to say. He wants me to tell him what I think and he wants me to tell him how I feel. But that is true. That is absolutely true because the Bible is wrought with scripture after scripture and story after story about how God delights in his children and he invites them into a relationship with him. I mean, we just did this story and all the Old Testament, that was the biggest problem, right? It was the Israelites' biggest issue that they failed to think relationally and form a relationship with God, that they could draw near to him. They just kept it formal. And so when the disciples, Jesus' disciples, observe Jesus, when they observe his close, intimate relationship with God, it blew them away that someone would talk to God that way. Because you see, in the Gospels, over and over again, we find Jesus praying. We find him going off by himself to pray, don't we? You've probably heard this before. But you know, um, you know uh, the Luke 3.21 says this, Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. You think heaven opens when we pray? Matthew 14, 23, after he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And it was evening and he was there alone. Mark 1, in the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and he went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Mark 6, 46, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. Luke 5, 16, but Jesus himself would often slip away into the wilderness and pray. And I could go on and on and give you verse after verse with examples of Jesus withdrawing from people and going to spend time alone with God. And so this intimacy blew away his followers. And so they came and they asked him, they said, how do you do that? I mean, how do you get God to listen to you? Right? Because when you pray, things happen. When you pray, God shows up. They come to him and they say, teach us to do what you do. Show us how to pray. And then Jesus answers them. He says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So the first thing that Jesus teaches his disciples about prayer is to be authentic. Okay, to be real. He says, don't be like the hypocrites who were just making a spectacle of themselves or who were just doing it for show. And the word hypocrite here isn't being used in exactly the same way that we often use this today. You know, because uh, today when we call someone a hypocrite, um, what we're saying is they don't practice what they preach. They tell you not to do something, but then they do it. That's not the way this word is being used. Here, uh, here, like hypocrite means actors, pretenders. Think about that for a second. Do you pretend when you pray? This is, this is talking about, you know, people who aren't being honest with themselves and they're not being honest with God. They're just doing it for show. Can I tell you this hits home for me? Because this is a trap that pastors Okay, and people who are in professional ministry often, often fall into. Because we pray in public and we pray you know, in ways that others don't 
always, right? I mean, like we're the paid prayer. And so there's often this pressure to pray well, right? And to say things in a way that sounds eloquent and refined, right? Well, guess what? The thoughts in my head aren't always so eloquent. They're not always so refined or polished. And what's in my heart doesn't always sound so polite either, right? And so it's easy for people in these positions, right, to pray in ways that are inauthentic, that aren't really true. And so he says, don't be like that. Go to your room. Shut the door. Because no one else needs to be here for this. This is between me and you, right? So be authentic and be real with me. And then he goes on to say this. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so you see like this teaching, this is teaching the disciples like something about honest relationships. And he's teaching them how God hears. He says, it doesn't matter what you say or how you say it. Man, that's awesome. It doesn't matter what you say or how you say it because God listens to your heart, okay? You can't fool him by your flowery words. You can't dress this up in a way that's gonna sound better than it really is, you know? You know, because it's really funny how our kids approach us when they want something, right? You know, when our kids really want something. I mean, I'm not going to drop any names of my kids this morning. um, But I know full well when one of my kids is trying to butter me up for something, right? Because they use, it's the words they use. Like they'll come to me and they'll say, good morning, father. You know, it's a really nice morning today, isn't it? It's not raining. You know, I think this would be a really good morning uh, to go swimming. You know, you should take us swimming today because, Dad, I miss you. Right? They talk to us differently when they want something. But you know what? They're not fooling me. Right? They're not fooling anybody. And Jesus is saying, don't be like that kid. Right? Don't be that kid because God already knows what you want and he already knows what you need even before you ask. And then, and then Jesus really blows their minds and he says, pray like this. Our Father. He says, think of God as your Father, as your Daddy. In the garden, Jesus was so distraught in prayer that he actually called out for his daddy. Okay? He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. He's saying, you've got all authority, daddy. All things are possible for you, so remove this cup from me, please, daddy. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And so you see the picture that Jesus gives his disciples of God is that of a father who knows the heart of his children. And he gives them a picture of a God who really listens to his children, who knows their needs, and who really sincerely wants this close, intimate relationship with them. Jesus informs us that God listens differently than we do. He doesn't just listen to our words. He listens to our hearts. And because he really listens, and because he really understands, and because he understands, he knows when the time is right to respond. He responds as good fathers do. He responds with what is best and at the right time. My daughter's not getting an iPhone no matter how much she asks me. Because good dads know when the right time is. I don't know what your how your prayer lives are right now. I don't know if you are elated in life or you're discouraged. 
if you're frustrated or if you're excited. I don't know. But God does. God already knows, and believe me, he wants you to tell him all about it. And we're going to do something here um, in a second that might feel a little uncomfortable because most of us have prayed uh, in a way, prayed the same way, you know, for most of our lives. And some of us have prayed the Lord's Prayer the same way for most of our lives. But today I'd like us to pray it together in a less formal manner. Because Jesus, as Jesus said, we don't need to just say the right words for our Heavenly Father to hear us, right? His door is always open. And even though he gave us the model for prayer in the Lord's Prayer, he didn't necessarily mean recite these words. You know, when he said pray like this, and he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even though he gave us that model and he told us this word to pray in this way, he didn't necessarily mean recite this word for word every time you pray. This is a heart condition, not a word condition. This is a heart issue. And so... In 1983, Eugene Peterson began writing a new translation of our scriptures. And I know that sounds bad, just to say. He wanted to pen a Bible that spoke in plain and contemporary English. And many people have criticized him for it, saying that he was changing scripture. But in all fairness to Eugene Peterson, he wasn't translating or rewording English into contemporary English, right? He went back to the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And it took him 10 years to do. And 10 years later, he published the message paraphrase. I don't know if it's a paraphrase. I've been told it's a paraphrase. But if you go back to the original script, I mean... That doesn't sound like a paraphrase to me, but, and you know, I agree that um, I probably wouldn't use the message translation as a primary scriptural source or a study Bible. But you know, most times when I read the message, man, it's a powerful and straightforward word in a way that some other translations aren't. So this morning, I'm going to close us in prayer, and then I'm going to ask all of us to pray together from Peter's, from um, his, trans, his translation and see what plainly resonates within your heart as you get the meaning of the words that you're saying more than the actual words. Okay, and that might feel uncomfortable, but, you know, if we're, if we're not taking risks, are we really Christians? So let's try something new. So would you bow in prayer with me first and just say, Father God, we can't fool you. Lord, there are people here today with pain in their heart. There are people here with, who have experienced loss. There are people here um, who have experienced anger. Father God, and we just ask now that you would examine us, that you would lay us bare before you, Lord, and that in our hearts we would confess and agree with you about our condition. Lord, would you remove any obstacles between us right now? Would you help us, Father, to be honest, so honest with ourselves so we can move forward, Lord, knowing that we cannot butter you up, that we can't say anything that you don't already know about our condition, Lord, that we cannot manipulate you into feeling any more love for us than you already do. Father God, can we have that kind of a relationship with you this morning? Lord, I am so happy to be here. I am so happy to be, to be in your house this morning. And I am so happy to be part of a people who pray 
and people who want, Lord, to be your hands and your feet and your voice and your presence in this community. I'm so thrilled to be part of that. Father, would you help us to do it better? Would you hear us, Lord? Help us to do all the things that you've called us to do. All this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. And now would you stand as we pray the Lord's Prayer together from Eugene Peterson's The Message Bible and just say, Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes.